Tim's chart on his recovery. And this is with just with ozonated saline. So are we started again? Yeah. Okay, this is Sheila Hemphill with Texas Right to Know. This is part two of our initial um, discussion with Dr. Jack Michelle of the Larkin Community Hospital in, uh, where are you on, Florida? Miami. Miami, Florida. So we had the privilege of hearing from Dr. James Thorpe, who I have been working with to develop uh, Institutional Review Board guidelines so that we can begin clinical research as well as the addition of a compassionate use such that um, it can address more immediate needs of use of ozone that has shown to be beneficial in clinical trials taking place in China, Italy, and Spain. On the screen, I have the data from Dr. Thorpe's hypoxia control of where an individual was placed in a hood and over a four minute time frame, the O2 sats dropped to 56. After the individual who is a trained uh, professional athlete <clears throat> done in under supervision of a physician was able to uh, re to get his uh, oxygen back, he rebounded very quickly to normal levels. And after a designated time frame where all of his um, data came back to normal ranges of pulse rate, blood pressure, O2 sats, he received an IV of ozonated saline and went back under the hood to repeat the, re the study. And this time, where he reached a 56 drop in his O2 sats, once he received the ozonated saline, it was only at 85 in the same time frame, actually a little longer. So those numbers are incredibly simple to evaluate and to see the dramatic increase of oxygenation issue that ozonated saline has the capacity to provide. So we will be working on getting two different um, Institutional Review Board IRB documentations in place. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Uh, now I believe it was Marco, wasn't it you talking about the, you gave a very good oration of the clarity of the two different um, trials we're under. If you would refresh that, that would be great. So you have two different matters. Uh, the one, the first one, it's the IRB portion of the clinical trial, multi-center clinical trial. That's one. And basically, that's, it's virtually to give us access to understand and share the data between the centers to make sure that we come up after all is done, we come up with a, a guidance or guideline that everyone can use, whether that's for treat COVID-19 complications or uh, the coal or whatever that is. Uh, that's, that's the research and that's the IRB for. Now, then we have the immediate need to treat patients that we deem or we think they will benefit immediately from the use of ozone. And that's when the Department of Health Services have made very clear that um, we can apply these therapies in the best, you know, and best of our knowledge with a specific rationale. For instance, I can claim ozone therapy is going to cure COVID-19 complications or it's going to treat the vital load, whatever that is. But I can say, in the conditions that this patient is right now, I know that ozone has been shown to decrease the inflammatory response. I'm seeing an inflammatory response. I'm going to go with this treatment. So that's a compassionate care by the Department of Health Services. It's, it's been doing because we don't want to go and run into a process that we accelerate the IRB process, okay? And then we're going to fall back in exactly the same thing. So why would we need an IRB if they're not going to do their job? So uh, I think the immediate need is to make the technology and the treatment accessible and define very well which are the patients that are going to receive the treatment. Because if we do a trial way, it's like, okay, 
I can randomize, so you get it, you don't get it. What are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? You can know these kind of complicated ethical questions. But right now, for me, it's very clear. If you are on the respirator or you are, we can define them again, uh, what we call severity staging, and you are in stage three, and we have basically all the options we have, therapeutic options we use, or most of the therapeutic options that we have available, here's come ozone to the rescue in the sense that potentially can ameliorate that inflammatory response. Uh, right now we have, I want to say, good indicators of whether or not the person is going to end in this stage. Um, I think it's yeah, up to 80 to 85. Stats have, the stats we have out of Italy in the 46, 46 patient second report from the SIOT was an 84% increase, uh, uh, improvement. From Spain, of the 36 patients who were diagnosed with pneumonia and would, were on their way to intensive care, uh, or may have been in intensive care, on respiratory assistance, only one required inhibition, and all 36 have recovered. Now that is coming from a Dr. Amato uh, DeMonte, and the 36 patient, I was mistaken, that's with Udini, Italy. In Spain is the uh, study that I just received, which is two known therapies to be useful as an adjuvant therapy. Now see, that's a very important term. We don't wanna be using the term treatment because that's complicated with FDA. An adjuvant therapy, very similar to how off-label use of medications are done. So it's an adjuvant therapy. So here is the 17 page report that I will have available off the website. And there's a Dr. Papadakis here at the University of Rochester that I'm in contact with. And I have emailed Dr. Alberto Hernandez. So I anticipate having directs with them as well as Dr. Franzini in Italy. Uh, this group uses the WFOOT World Federation uh, protocols. But whether it's Japan, I'm sorry, China, Spain, or Italy, it's all pretty much the same. It's done with the blood. They either pull anywhere from 100 mil like they did in China or 200 mil like they did in Udine. So it, 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 there's um, it's um, different protocols of concentration. Now, the concentration of ozone is designated as uh, micrograms per milliliter, which is also referred to as a gamma. So I know some people were kind of having heartburn about the term gamma, but I'm like, well, that's how concentrations of ozone are designated. Um, do y'all all have longevity? I saw longevity on your demonstration. In fact, I went and pulled up my chart that was shown in the video. Um, does everybody already have a longevity generator? Hello? I believe we have. Well, that is. It's a, uh, uh, Dr. That's what Dr. Richard used uh, on Saturday. The ozone know. generator. Yeah, yeah. It's an ozone generator. I don't know what what type it is. Yeah, it was Longevity. It was the company that I was talking about that we're going to use them as a standard. You recognize to, it from the video? You what now? You recognize it from the video? Yeah. Uh huh. Because oh. I went and got my own chart. Okay. And, it was, and it was on his bottle. So I was glad to see that. I see, I see it. Yeah, I see now. Longevity said that on the top. You're right. Uh huh. So yeah. uh, now we're not trying to be a monopoly for a, a one particular company. We want to standards of what a good company looks like. And right now, of the awards that this company's been given, they're out of Canada. Right now, this is what I would consider a standard setting requirement. Uh, like they have a, the, the corona is created in a solid glass tube that the ozone never comes in contact with any plastics or metals or even ceramics because ceramics have uh, additives to hold it together. So these are certain parameters that we're trying to, to work out so that we're not perceived as some sort of monopolistic trying to promote just one single type of generator. We want pure calibrated medical grade equipment with medical grade oxygen as our baseline. 
So once I get the uh, IRB document, if uh, who's going to be sending me information to everybody's email? Yeah, Uzam, you're going to do that, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. And then if y'all in the chat, what's, in the, what's the cost of those? Um, they range, the one I have is a 120T unit. Um, I think they're around 3,500 and it came with some 35, 38. The higher one that showed in the demonstration on my website I showed has two ports for syringes and I think it's 68. I don't know. As I said, um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what that was, but that one has two ports and a pedal. So there's two ports for your syringes. So where, uh, I don't know who that was that was in the video, how he had to have the, the cable and the T valve to load a syringe. These you just screw right in and you hit a foot pedal and it fills it. It also comes with that extra long tube he had, which is, which is a destruct. So while this is running, it's generating ozone that has to come out of the unit. So it runs through that little tube which has carbon filters in there. So what comes out of it is just oxygen. So that's so that you're not, you should not breathe, um, directly breathe in ozone. However, if you bubble ozone gas through olive oil, what comes out are the ozonides. So the attributes of ozone gas that are harmful to the lungs can be filtered out by bubbling it through an oil and what you get are the ozonides, which actually is what ozone uh, turns into when it gets into your blood. So um, that's something to consider. My question is, who would be available? I know everybody here, because I can tell that we're going over your hour time frame for your meetings. So I want to be respectful of people's time, but I didn't know what people's availability were. Um, my information is in the chat. I take calls from 9 central in the morning to 11 p.m. at night, trying to accommodate as many um, international time zones so we can get this moving. Jack, what do, we, what do you need What do you need from me? Right now, the protocols uh, that okay. we're referring to, and then Uzam is gonna be in touch with you. Um, Uzam, could you, I, I guess when you, as you talk to Sheila, you can determine whether we need to meet, you know, again this week at some point to discuss this further. Sure. Um, and then we can obviously just send an invite and uh, I'm, okay. I'm open. Uh, just check with me. I have a couple of other Zoom meetings coming up. I have one coming up in like 15 minutes, but. Okay, Uzum, can you get me where the locations of where the initial uh, inpatient clinical trials might go? Jack? Yeah, there's hospital if, locations, Uzum. Okay, and if you're not opposed to, I still would like to kind of know the stats on your outpatient because you I know, believe. What do you, what do you want to know? Um, Locations, um, capacity. Yeah, we have a full, we have a full um, send me what you need, what the parameters you need, but we have 1,200 people okay. positive that we have some data on. And what kind of time frames do you think are realistic? We're, we're the first hospital you'd want to start with and kind of ramp up what this project would look like, I uh, think about how many patients you may anticipate. It. We're going to discuss it at the meeting today. Because I think what we need to do is set up a protocol with Dr. Richter. By the way, I think Dr. Richter should probably be invited to this call. Who's uh, Dr. Richter? He's the one. Dr. Richter is the, pro, the director of our uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation okay. uh, program, and he's the one that's used, been using ozone for a long time, and he's the one that suggested that we should use Excellent. it. Excellent. When's has, that meeting? Uh, well, we 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 can schedule something with him and Sheila Uzam, and maybe the okay. group just so that he can go over because he does have a protocol okay he wants to follow to determine who gets what when okay. uh we have a clinical team that meets today at three o'clock that that's among all the things that they're going to discuss it'll be okay. the together and develop that so our job here in research is basically just to kind of try to put that in the form in which we can track it and and put it put it through irb if necessary or at least somehow give some guidance as to what needs to be monitored would you Sheila, okay. stuff with Sheila I, I send you my, an email with okay. my info. I need to read Good. all the documentation. And then uh, if I, you know, based, based on what I see, 
then it's going to be time to put together an IRB application. And only people okay. that have CITI training can do this. Okay. I don't know who many people have that training here. So I don't. You're talking about being not, a, a primary investigator? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. We can. I, I'm going to find. I'm going to find out who can be internally the PI, because you need to have certain credentials for that. There. Right. That's one piece of of the puzzle. Today okay. is the guideline team that is the other part to compassionate care, so we can apply it as soon as possible. Yeah, so, you know what? I, what I suggest, Marcus, is I, I took the CITI training. It's 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 like a, it takes about a day. It's online. It, there's a yeah. like fifty dollars or a hundred dollars. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I, what, you can get one of our volunteers to do it. I mean, it'll be something good for the resume. Some of them are applying from med schools. Or, now, or, uh, uh, the primary, my understanding is that the primary locations, which depending on if, the, if we fold your activities under Jack, uh, Jim's activities, he would be, quote, primary. Primary has to be an MD. Mm -hmm. A subprimary at the primary location has to, can be an MD or a DO. Then you have various different remote locations where the uh, sub investigator can be a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, an MD or a DO that have the training yeah. that Marcus so is talking one about. Of the, one of the graduated doctors in the group, like, you know, several, we have several of them already that are not medical students, but already finished medical school and actually uh, trying to get into residency training. Uh, they're already MDs. So uh, they probably would qualify, right, Marcos? If they have the CITI training, yes. The thing yeah. is that all, my residents have it, uh, because we are affiliated to use, use your people. residence. Uh, I mean, how much? What is it like eighty dollars to do that? No, no. We our residents can take it for free because we have the link on. Uh, okay, uh, so credential. You know what? either use your residence or offer it to the people in this group that are already physicians, the ones that already finished medical school. Uh, maybe they want to take it, and then that way you have a pool of people that you can use. Yeah. Okay. So we we have two separate groups that uh, ozone and one group for the surveys that we have the other project. So we have to broken down in, the, in little small projects so we can spread. Yeah. My fellows are training CITI. So okay. everything IRB, they can be on. Okay, Marcus, have, what, mm -hmm. what is your availability this afternoon? It seems like Marcus and Usman, we need to synchronize based off yeah, Jack's you guys need to have another meeting. And I have, a, I have the been... guidelines meet there at three. Um, I'm pretty much open from uh, after the end of this call and okay. on, until three. Yeah, actually, okay. I have a meeting coming up in 10 minutes. Why don't you guys um, share a new Zoom number? You guys can continue. Actually, okay. the whole group can continue. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, Uzam. If you want to just send everybody a new Zoom number. Sure. No, then, uh, Jack, you can, you can make someone else the uh -huh. host. And then you yeah, can leave. I'm using, I'm using this for the contact tracing oh, team. You need, um, your, you need your Zoom meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, um, why, don't you, why don't you send a Zoom yourself, uh, Marcus? Okay. Why don't you turn off the recording, Jack? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll have those two videos. Um, I guess we 